from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is David Mallon. I am the Deputy Librarian of Congress, and I want to welcome all of you to the National Book Festival, the 15th Annual National Book Festival. Uh, before we begin, I just really have two housekeeping matters for you. Uh, first of all, you'll notice that we have a camera in the back, and of course, there's recording. We are recording this uh, program today, and so after the end, we will have some questions and answers, and so if you do ask a question, we take that as permission that we can record you, and uh, it'll be preserved at the Library of Congress, and we hope to have this webcast available on our website. Uh, the second housekeeping matter is that I ask all of you to please uh, silence your electronic devices if you should have any of them. So thank you very much. Now, as many of you may know, policymakers, especially here in Washington, D.C., on the federal level, have had an active interest in STEM education over the years. And by STEM education, I'm talking about a teaching and learning in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And as a father myself to two daughters, I know that this issue is especially important as an issue for girls because we want to encourage them in areas that, that our society has traditionally uh, and historically targeted toward boys. And so actually I'm very delighted to see uh, quite a few girls sitting in the audience. Um, and that's why I chose to introduce this particular program and I'm particularly honored to be able to introduce our guest this morning, Rachel Swaby, so that she, uh, when she talks about her book, Headstrong, 52 Women Who Changed Science and the World. The Washington Post has uh, hailed this book as a collection of brisk, bright biographies. The New York Times Book Review has noted that Swaby tells the scientist stories with energy and clarity. And so I think that's really important as we try to reach out to girls with examples of girls or women. Um, and these are particularly brilliant examples of the women uh, in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics areas that, that prove that uh, girls and women can do it. So let me tell you a little bit about Rachel. She's a freelance journalist based in Brooklyn. She has had works appearing in Runner's World, Wired, The New Yorker, and many other magazines. She's a senior editor uh, at Longshot Magazine and a former editor-in-chief of The Connective, which I didn't know anything about, and I'm told is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, and a former presenter for something called Pop-Up Magazine, uh, which I'm told is the Columbia Journalism, I'm sorry, I'm missing my notes here. I can't read, obviously, this morning. Um, so uh, it, she is a former presenter for Pop-Up Magazine, which the Columbia Journalism Review has described as a live magazine that presents nonfiction stories narrated on stage. Actually, that to me sounds very exciting. Anyway, with that, please join me in welcoming Rachel Swaby to the stage. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction. Good morning. Thank you for being here. This is so thrilling. Um, uh, so today, uh, so I wrote a book about women in science, and today I'd like to start with Mary Curie, double Nobel Prize winner, discoverer of polonium and radium. You know her, hopefully you love her, and I'm not going to talk about her. Um, because She's who we talk about when we talk about women in science. Um, I started writing this book about two years ago, right as I had moved to Brooklyn from California. And um, stoop sales are a thing that happen in Brooklyn. So there was one happening across the street, and um, I went over to try to make friends with my neighbors. And uh, there was a deck of cards, a famous scientist's deck of cards. I was so excited, so I picked it up. I was like, this is perfect for the book. Ran back home, fanned them out. Marie Curie, the only one, the only woman. So, okay. And then I started writing the book and I started telling people, oh, I'm writing this book about the history of women in science, it's this incredible history, and they'd say, oh, right, Marie Curie. <laughs> Every single one, I, not another answer. She was the only answer. So today, I'm not going to be talking about her. Um, hopefully what we'll get today in 30 minutes is a richer, fuller, totally surprising, and not just because they're women, history of the world and beyond. Um, I've got my work cut out for me, so um, we're gonna jump right in. Um, 
We are going to start from the center of the world and we're going to go up to the stars. So to start at the center of the world, we're going to have to start in a backyard in Denmark in the 1930s. So we're in a backyard, we're at a table, there's a garden. Sitting at this table is Inga Lehman, and she has oatmeal boxes, empty oatmeal boxes, shoved full of index cards. It's a Saturday, she's working on the weekend. Um, she used to say that she was the only Danish seismologist, and I think what that means is you have to do a lot of work on the weekends, because she, she was the only one handling everything. Um, and uh, so seismology at the time wasn't a specialty with very much funding. And she was in Denmark. When was the last time you heard about a huge earthquake happening in Denmark? <laughs> yeah, so she kind of ran the whole department. It was her, her, her thing. Um, she had a network of seismographs, and she had to kind of keep that data. Um, and so she's sitting there with these index cards with the data. And she was finding some peculiar things. So Denmark, although it doesn't have a lot of earthquakes, it's a great place to catch the seismic waves coming through the earth because South America, a lot of earthquakes over there. Um, so, so the waves would travel through the earth and she would catch them and she'd look at the data. So she was finding something a little bit peculiar. Little background. In 1914, the German geophysicist Benno Gutenberg used seismic data to find that in the middle of the earth there was a core. Um, so there was liquid magma below the Earth's crust and mantle. Um, and he figured this out by looking at the seismic readings. So she was looking at her seismic readings, and most everything aligned with this core. So the seismic waves were going through the Earth, and they were landing where they were supposed to be at the right speed. But there were a few that just weren't landing. They were like that terrible friend you have where they show up late, they show up at the wrong time. Um, it was a little peculiar. So she knew, she was a stickler for data, so she knew that this wonky thing, um, there was something to it. Um, so she did the work to try to figure it out. Um, when seismic waves travel through the Earth, they slow down in liquid. And at the barriers between layers, the waves refract. So knowing all of this, um, considering the location of the earthquake event and the location and speed of the waves, she was able to find something else in the data, a solid 750 mile pinball of metal. So not that, I mean, 750 miles in the center of the earth that we didn't know about. That seems pretty huge, right? <laughs> so she didn't get a lot of, she, she wrote the paper, she made the discovery, and there wasn't very much interest. And then she waited and she waited, um, and then she was kind of traveling around, um, going to different research laboratories after she'd retired. And um, when she was there, she summarized her eventual success to a colleague. She says, the way you go, the way it works is you go along and nothing happens. And then you get one medal and everybody else notices and thinks you're respectable for the medal. And so you start getting a lot of medals. <laughs> Okay, so she was complaining about, kind of, about the attention, but I have to say that the attention, was, it just wasn't enough. Because imagine me, about this time last year, deeply sleep deprived, um, working on the book. I have fewer than five profiles left to write, and it is killing me, frankly, and um, somebody drops out. I don't get the right research, um, or it does, doesn't feel like a story to me, so I need to find another, another person to profile. Um, so I feel like I haven't really covered geology, so I start looking into it, and I spend a day pulling up everything I can, and at the end of the day, I find that a woman discovered the inner core of the Earth, and it took me a day and many months of research to find it. Um, so maybe she could have used a little more, a few more medals. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, what I think was so flummoxing about that whole situation is that I would have loved to have learned about her when I was younger. I mean, it's such a tangible thing. I mean, you can draw it. We learn about the layers of the Earth. Um, why didn't we know that she 
discovered it. And I wondered if I had heard about her as a child, would it have changed the way that I viewed my own education, to know that there were women who contributed to our understanding of the earth and beyond? So the answer to that question is I don't know for Inga Lehman, but there is one person who as an adult completely changed the way that I thought about STEM, specifically mathematics. So we have to go to Russia to tell her story. So from Denmark to Russia in, in the 1860s. And we are sitting in front of a wall with an 11-year-old, and that 11-year-old is Sophie Kowalewski. She loves this wall. Her governess does not like her going to this wall, and she sneaks away, and she sits in front of this wall, and she just studies it. Why are we at this wall in Russia in the 1860s? A little backstory. So her father was a general, and he retired, and they moved to the country. So when you have a country a state, when you're a general, you want to kind of freshen it up with new wallpaper. So they did the whole house, and they got to nursery, and they realized no more wallpaper. Well, it's not like in the 1860s in Russia, you can just type it into Amazon and it will arrive. Um, they were a little bit stuck being out in the country. It would have been a really long process to get the nursery covered with wallpaper. So her father had some lithographed lectures on differential and integral calculus. <laughs> so they went up in the nursery. <laughs> um, and she loved it. As a child, she didn't understand it. Um, when she was a young girl, she didn't understand the equations, but she studied them. And so when she finally did learn calculus, like a piece of the puzzle, she was able to plug that knowledge into her new knowledge. And what I really love about Sophie is this wonderful story, but also that um, she was just so creative, and she had, and not just creative in math, but kind of in everything she did. She was a novelist, she wrote two plays, she wrote an autobiography, she did literary criticism, um, she did um, a thesis in astronomy as well as two in math. I mean, she was, had a very, very well-rounded interests, and she said something about mathematics that as I said before, really changed the way I thought about them. She said that it was a mistake of the uninformed to think of mathematics as um, a pile of dry and arid numbers that you multiply and divide. Mathematics was art. Mathematics was poetry. Now, poetry is something that I, as an English major, can get, get behind. Like, that's that is amazing, that sounds amazing. And I think, had I known that and heard about Sophie and known about how kind of fascinated with, with mathematics, how fascinated she was as a child, I think perhaps it would have changed the way that I thought about my own education. So Sophie went on to, um, to do some wonderful things. She, um, she was not only creative in her work, but she was creative in her approaches to actually being able to do the work she loved. So in Russia in the late 1800s, it wasn't, her father wasn't a promoter of women in education. So as long as she lived in her father's house, she would have to stay there and, and kind of not further her studies. Or she could get married, but that meant that she was under someone else's roof and she also wouldn't continue to study. So, she got creative about the problem and entered into a sham marriage that would allow her to kind of let her father would be able to let her go and she could go to Europe and study. So that is exactly what she did and she thought she'd get to Germany and she'd be able to get into a university and all would go well. It was a little tougher than that. Many, many places said, oh no, there's no way that, that, that you're going to study here. And finally, um, she, she was able to um, convince a professor um, with her work that she was, worth, um, she was worth bringing in. She tackled a mathematical mermaid, a problem that had eluded many greats. Of the 15 entries submitted anonymously, hers took the prize and they doubled the pot because her, her solution was so great. Um, speaking of creativity, we're now going to go from Russia to Italy. 
Um, and we are going to spend some time in a bedroom, not like that, with Rita, who was a doctor. Um, she was Jewish and Italian um, during World War II, and so in the late um, 1930s, she was no longer able to practice or do research. So that's kind of a bummer if you're a research scientist. So she said, fine, if I can't work in a lab, I'm gonna make my own. So she made a lab in her bedroom. Um, her, brother, uh, her brother helped her make an incubator. She made a scalpel from a filed down knitting needle. She acquired a watchmaker's forceps and scissors made for an ophthalmologist, and there she was, up and running, a lab. And she used fertilized chicken eggs, something that she could get um, as, uh, to experiment on. Um, the way she got those fertilized chicken eggs is she would hop on her bike, go down the street, go to a neighbor and say, oh, my babies, they're so hungry, can you give me some eggs? And they would say, okay, fine, you can have these. And she'd say, oh, no, 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 fertilized, fertilized eggs are more nutritious, so those are the ones I need. She'd take those eggs home. She didn't have children. She vowed never to get married and devote herself to science. Um, and there she had. She had the eggs, she had the incubator, she had the scalpel. Um, and she was able to do, um, she dissected the embryos, cutting their spines into slices. And she looked at nerve cells. And the research paper that she wrote, based on that research, she published, um, and it got seen by a prominent scientist in the US. She went out there for what was supposed to be a couple of months and stayed for decades. Um, so this creativity in everything, in, in the research, but also in doing the research, was a common theme among um, all of the women that I I researched for the book. And also this creating spaces that worked for them. In many cases, people would go and say, oh, I'd like, to, I'd like to work here, I'd like to be here, or I'd like a voice in this way, and they were told no. Um, so they said, well, that sucks. But they made their own spaces. They set up a bedroom lab. They set up a lab in the janitor's closet, in an attic. Um, wherever they could get to have a space of their own. It's very Virginia Woolf. Again, appreciate it. Um, and some of these spaces were just spaces for them to have a voice that really kind of showed their strongest attributes. So Anne McLaren, a pioneer in in vitro fertilization research, used to sat, sit with her colleagues each morning and discuss what was new in science. And it was from these conversations. She was a really clear thinker. Um, she was really sharp and put, kind of putting these things together um, and kind of talking it out was, was great for her. And, and it was because of some of these conversations that her, her, research, um, her research went forward. And then when she was a teacher later on and when she had students, she brought she brought these conversations back and they'd sit together and discuss the science because that was a great forum for her. Um, Gertie and Carl Corey did the same thing. Um, they had a similar kind of lunch with students where they range, they, the subjects they talk about would range from books to stories to science. Um, and it was an energizing space for them and, uh, and, it, and, it, and it worked. So I've taken that, taken that away as a, for myself, but also for others, it's just like find the space that works best for you. And if you can't find it, make it. Gertie Corey um, said this beautiful thing um, as a This I Believe series, um, despite facing many challenges about where she was allowed to work, the, her, her love of science really drove her. And she has this great quote, and so I'm gonna read it. She says, the love for and dedication to my work seems to me to be the basis for happiness. As a research worker, the unforgotten moments of my life are those rare ones, are those rare ones which come after years of plotting work, where the veil over nature's secrets seems suddenly to lift, and when what was dark and chaotic appears in a clear and beautiful light and pattern. I love that. Um, so from that wonderful quote, I'm going to transition to one of my favorites. They're all my favorites. But this one is 
one of my favorites because Alice Hamilton um, reminds me of the journalist that I would love to be. Um, she, she was really a reporter and I, I really admire her work. So to learn about her work, we're gonna go to Chicago, um, Newsies era Chicago, so turn of the century. Um, and to pick up with Alice, we are going to find her in the lab dabbing cocaine in her eye. Um, she's a pathologist with a medical degree, and at the moment she's waging a war with lawyers and drugstore clerks peddling cocaine to children. Um, so children would come home from school, and these drugstore clerks would say, um, you know, would you like a sample of this happy dust? <laughs> the kids loved it. So... <laughs> But the next day when they came back, they had to pay for it. And so then their kids getting money, it's a little tough, so then there was crime, and then it became a much bigger problem. Um, and so some social reformers were called in, and the social reformers asked Alice Hamilton to come in and test the powder. So she learned how to test the powder in a lab to figure out if it was cocaine or not. But there was this weird thing, the test, the lab test didn't it didn't tell the difference between cocaine and the synthetic version. So lawyers got wind of this and they were like, oh, well, you can't prove it. It's definitely the synthetic version. Um, but she did know one thing. She knew that cocaine would dilate the eye and the alpha and beta eucanes would not. So she tried it on bunnies. The jury was not thrilled with this tactic. They did not like seeing, like hearing about the bunnies, hearing about the, it just didn't go over well at all. So, um, so Alice Hamilton decided to make herself a test, test subject. She recalled, um, other people were understandably quite reluctant to take the risk. I used to go around the laboratory with one wide and one narrow pupil till everyone was so used to it that they took no notice. Um, uh, she, so, great story, but she, she also went on, um, worked with some social, she also went on um, a friend of hers, also one of the social re reformers. Um, there was a typhoid fever outbreak in, a, in the tenement housing right near where she lived. And a friend was like, you should go check it out. I bet you can figure out w w what, was, what was happening um, because she was a pathologist. So she went to the source of the problem and she investigated. So she went through the tenement housing and this is what she found. She says, as I prowled about the streets and the ramshackle wooden tenement houses, I saw the outdoor privies, forbidden by law but flourishing nevertheless, some of them in backyards below the level of the street and overflowing in heavy rains. The wretched water closets indoors, one for four or more families, filthy and with the plumbing out of order because nobody was responsible for cleaning or repairs, and swarms of flies everywhere. Here, I thought, was the solution to the problem. The flies were feeding on typhoid-infected ex excretia and then lighting on food and milk. Sounds like a pretty good theory. So she, um, uh, so she, she got the flies, she tested them. There we go, typhoid, the flies had typhoid. Um, uh, and it was just this sort of thing to catch public attention. It was simple, it was easy to understand. It made sense why people with kind of screened-in kitchens didn't, were not having the outbreak, and people who didn't have screened-in kitchens were having the outbreak. Um, there was also fit in with revelations made during the Spanish War. Um, it ex uh, and um, yeah, so Alice caught and tested the flies, and sure enough, typhoid. So. This made a big splash. People loved this revelation. Hooray for Alice Hamilton. Um, she said that this paper brought her more acclaim than almost anything else she'd done. There was a problem, it wasn't, it wasn't true. So <laughs> what do you do when you make this big splashy discovery and it's, it's totally not right? It turned out, found out later that there was a three day sewage leak that contaminated the drinking water in that area. And it was one that was actively covered up by the municipal government. So Alice 
booked a lot of speaking engagements, um, and she'd often be, like, late in life, she'd often be introduced with this wonderful story of finding the cause for typhoid fever, for the typhoid fever outbreak in Chicago. And she would graciously take the stage and correct the record. For years, although I did my best to lay the ghost of those flies, they haunted me and mortified me compelling me again and again to explain to deeply impressed audiences that the dramatic story their chairman had just rehearsed had little foundation, in fact. Um, uncovering these truths, no matter how buried in muck, was what made Hamilton so exceptionally effective at assessing unsafe environments. And I really admire it. How hard must it have been to have this great discovery, the one you're famous for, and then to have to go back and retract it. Um, amazing. Um, so in 1910, based on this great work, Hamilton was hired as the managing director of the Occupational Disease Commission in Illinois. Um, it was the first commission of its kind in the country, and the task was to survey the state's poisonous occupations. Um, to figure out what kinds of plants were exposing workers to harmful substances like carbon monoxide, arsenic, turpentine, and to assess how many plants existed. The crazy thing was they didn't even know what plants were manufacturing with lead. They just didn't know. So they had to go to the ones that they thought kind of most likely manufactured with lead, and then they'd have to ask, so, do you know who else is doing this? And they'd have to go down the rabbit hole like that. Um, so uh, they found that there were kind of not so obvious lead producing plants like um, freight car seals, coffin trim, glass polishing, all of these manufactured with lead, they had no idea. Um, and what she found when she went into these buildings to assess them for safety was that many were improperly vented, they were dilapidated, there were workers on one side of the building getting poisoned, but they weren't even the ones working with leads, it was the one, the lead that was the ones over here, um, and because of the terrible workplace environment, it, like, it was the, all of it was bad. Um, so, one plant she found an astonishing 40% of employees had gone to the hospital for becoming leaded. So at first, you would imagine that um, the people who ran the factories welcomed her in. Oh, sure, fine, go look around. But then she got a reputation, and it became a little harder to get those kind of open invitations. So um, she said, fine, no problem. So she started hitting up hospitals and pulling records and looking for workers who had come in um, with telling signs. She went to the workers' houses and interviewed them when they were at home in a place where she felt they'd be more um, likely to open up. Uh, and it was like this that, um, that she made a pretty big difference. Um, by 1919, Alice was the foremost expert in industrial health in the United States. And that was kind of a problem for Harvard because Harvard wanted to expand their curriculum to include public health. And of course they wanted the best, but the best was a woman. So after a lot of trouble, she was hired. She was the first woman hired to Harvard's medical, medical school 26 years before female medical students were allowed admission to the university. There were a couple stipulations. She was not allowed into, in the Harvard club. She was not able to claim faculty tickets to football games. <laughs> And she was not allowed to participate in commencement ceremonies. But she said, despite all of this, it was a warm welcome. So, um, <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> after her year long study in Illinois with lead, the state passed a law that compensated workers for harmful exposure to gases, dusts, and fumes. And the law set off a systemic change. Um, employers began to insure against health-related claims. Insurance companies responded by pushing for workplace reforms. And by 1937, most of the states carrying the country's largest industrial burdens had adopted legislative requirements that workers had to be paid for being poisoned. Thanks to Alice Hamilton. Um, 
Her pioneering determination paved the way for real social change. The thread among these scientists is not their gender. It's a restlessness, it's a creativity, it's a dedication to their work, it's grit, it is just hearing that no and letting it wash over and finding another way. Um, there's also this ability to look at something people have been looking at forever and not accepting it and seeing maybe a truth that was overlooked. Um, the firecracker mathematician and computer scientist Grace Hopper advocated for people to think different long before it became an Apple catchphrase. To remind herself of this daily, she set a clock to run backwards in her office, just to keep herself to that standard. So even as she got older, she, would, she just felt it was so, so essential that she was always looking at a problem in a different way and not just accepting how it was given to her. When people said, but we've always done it that way, she threatened to come back and haunt them. <laughs> she was in the Navy and she did her presentations in her Navy uniform and man, should I be so lucky to have a little Grace Hopper on my shoulder haunting me always. Um, so this little guided tour I'm giving you, it is a tiny, minuscule, atom-sized sample of the extraordinary women who have made a difference in not only how we've seen the world, but how we experience it. Um, to give you a little, I mean, just everything. Chemotherapy treatments, nuclear fission, chaos theory, environmental protection, wrinkle-free cotton, Kevlar, computer bugs, all of these things. Women, women. <laughs> um, but sometimes the way that we talk about these scientists and their accomplishments obscures the person behind them. Um, I read the obitu obituary of Yvonne Brill when it came out. Do you guys remember this? It was from 2013, it was in the New York Times, and the first line was, she made a mean beef stroganoff. You remember that? Only in the second paragraph did they mention, oh yeah, she was thought to be the only woman, American woman working in rocket science in the 1940s. Oh yeah, she designed the propulsion system that keeps satellites in orbit. But she made a mean beef stroganoff, and she was the world's best mom, and she followed her husband from town to town. So I have to say that I was as outraged as everybody about this story, and yet, a year later, I still just remembered her as the beef stroganoff scientist. <laughs> so we need to be careful. Um, all right, a little, I lied at the beginning of the program, I said no more Marie Curie, but I am going to mention her one more time. Um, next time someone brings up the subject of women in science, I challenge you not to mention her name. You can do it, I believe in you. Um, instead, name Jane Wright the chemotherapy pioneer. Lise Metner, who was crucially important in the discovery of nuclear fission. Rachel Carson and her incredible work advocating for the, for the environment. Birth of the EPA, thanks to Rachel Carson. Ruth Benarito, who invented wrinkle-free cotton. Mary Cartwright and chaos theory. Grace Hopper, who pulled a moth from an early computer, taped it to her logbook, and that is why we know a computer bug it's called a computer bug. It was a real bug. It was in a real bug. In a, amazing. It's amazing. Um, Stephanie Qualick, whose cold spun polymers became Kevlar. In my physics classroom growing up um, in high school, there was this famous picture of Einstein sticking his tongue out. And I would have loved to have Einstein and then maybe a picture of Anne McLaren, the in vitro fertilization pioneer. She had this typewriter, which of course speaks to me as a writer, but she had, a, 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 above it, she had a spinning wheel where mice could run because she really liked being that close to her research. That picture is amazing as well. Like, that should have been on the wall. 
Um, or maybe um, Grace Hopper and her massive computer, the one that she tamed. These scientists and mathematicians should leap out of our mouths. We should be able to say, oh, Hedy Lamarr, you know her as a movie star, but she was also an inventor. Her frequency hopping invention paved the way for Wi-Fi. One small triumph, the New York Times article on Yvonne Brill, um, it was amended after the outcry, so they, they changed the opening. The article, in the article, they now call her a brilliant rocket scientist, which made me happy. That was better, much better. Um, but I do have like one nitpicky thing about it, and that is that she was certainly very, very, very smart. Um, but her brilliance wasn't the thing that brought her the achievement. It was, it was hard work. I mean, she could have been smart and never pushed through all of the obstacles that she did to do the amazing work she did. Her propulsion system that keeps satellites in orbit, she did that on her kitchen table after she was done with a regular work day. Um, she worked through the night. Uh, for a very long time to be able to do that. Um, so it was this hard work, the 10,000 tiny steps or 10,000 hours, however you'd like to put it, um, that kind of kept her, 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 her work going. Annie Jump Cannon summarized it well. She categorized some 400,000 stars throughout her career and was applauded for it. But she says, my success, if you would call it that, lies in the fact that I have kept at my work all these years. It is not genius or anything like that. It is merely patience. So with that, I send you off. May the stories here inspire you. May you share them with the world. And I sincerely hope that you keep at your passion, whether it be at the center of the earth or in the stars. Thank you. And if you have questions, come on up. I'll try to answer them. <laughs> um, so I feel like that would it's been about a year since I've written the book. So yes, that's awesome. I love that you know about Grace Hopper. Um, go look into it. <laughs> Good morning. I don't have a question so much as a shameless plug for um, a little school in Freeport, Maine called Coastal Studies for Girls. And we're a semester school for science and leadership for 10th graders. And this is what we're trying to do, instill this love of science. Wonderful. Um, and these girls and I will certainly share this book with, with the girls at the school. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, how, this one. How did you come up with the number of people, and how did you find these hidden talents? So I think initially I thought, Oh, we'll go for a hundred. Because the thing is, it's like there is just no lack of amazing women to profile. Like we could just kind of keep going on and on and on. Um, but then to do a hundred profiles, the book would have been very big, and the profiles would have had to be shorter. And what I realized is that I really liked learning about. Well, I, first of all, I wanted to write a story. I didn't want it to be like so and so did this, and then they did this, and then they did this, and then they died. Um, <laughs> which is, is valuable, but maybe not kind of my direct interest. So I wanted to make the profiles longer. And I also thought that it's nice to kind of sit with this. I mean, you can just, they're pretty short. You could breeze through the book, but it's nice to kind of have one and think about it a little bit. So we thought, you know, if, if everybody was to read one a week all year, they'd have a pretty good overview. Um, certainly not of everything but just a pretty good baseline. So that's how it, how it started. Thank Thanks. Hello, thank you for your talk. Could you tell us when you did your research, what were the things you found that were most surprising to you? Um, 
things I found that were most surprising. I think I truly, I truly didn't know all of the obstacles. I mean, I thought maybe going in, I thought that um, I certainly thought that it was hard for women in science, but I just didn't know the like career parkour that people had to do to <laughs> be able to become successful. And I, I, I maybe thought that it was it was brilliance that got people through, but after reading so much about it, I just realized that it was just, it was grit, it was just hard work, which, um, which was really heartening for someone like me who's like not brilliant. I think it made me feel like it, the more kind of universal quality is just that if you really, really work hard and then also just don't listen to, like if somebody says no, that's not the end. Um, and so I think that that was a really great lesson. And then the other thing was, is there's just no lack of women in science through history. There's not a finite number of people that we should be talking about. I mean, this book is just like a very small, small sliver. Um, and, and how surprising that I didn't know, you know, I worked at Wired Magazine for five years. I didn't know 90% of the people who were in the book before I started researching them. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, thank you for this wonderful talk, and I can't wait to read your book. Um, but sometimes Sophie Kovaleska is um, reported as Sonia Kovaleska, and does that, can you talk a little bit about why that is, and does that contribute to why she gets lost sometimes <laughs> in the literature? Whoa, man, I had a very, very long talk with <laughs> the editors and the copy editors about this. Um, and as I was researching, I had a really hard time too, because um, trying, I think it's just the translation, and in the end, um, the publisher and the copy editor um, made a case for why it should be this way, um, and I went along with it. But yeah, it was really, it was really tricky because um, the spelling of her name is all over the place. Like it was different in Brit Encyclopedia Britannica than it was in her bio autobiography, than it was in kind of somebody else's um, work on her life. So, so yeah, that that was. That was tough. <laughs> I wish I wasn't, I, I wish I could have just included like, these are all of this one person. Um, yeah, it was tough. Thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed the story of Alice Hamilton, who is both a scientist and a journalist and an advocate. And I'm reminded a bit of the woman who um, discovered that it's actually a bad idea to x-ray pregnant women. And I don't actually remember the name of the scientist, but she was in public health. And I wanted to ask about when we think about famous male scientists, we think about people who discovered things, but a lot of these women, Rachel Carson, Alice Hamilton, the don't you know, x-ray your pregnant wife woman, we think about people who not only discovered things, but then they also spent years trying to change the world to make things better. And I'm wondering if you noticed a pattern and if there was like a gender specific element to that desire to help. Um, interesting. That's interesting. I haven't thought about it in that way. Um, so Rachel, Rachel Carson wanted to be a scientist and was blocked. So she was not able to kind of do the science that she wanted to do. And so she ended up going back to kind of her kind of first love was writing. So she was able to kind of make a really big change that way. Um, yeah, I guess there were certainly many people in the book who were able to do that. I'm, I'm not, I don't know if I'm able to make a big kind of generalization about gender, but the, 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 maybe because they had to work so hard to, to, get, to get their work out that um, they ended up kind of being a, an advocate in that way. Okay, so I think we're about ready to be done. I think maybe one more question, or no? One more question? I just uh, wanted to mention that uh, Hedy Lamarr, uh, she also invented a bomb site, which probably shortened the war and saved a lot of lives. And she was from Germany. She was a German origin. Thank just you. Thank you for your book and your talk. Can we just get this, this okay. one question? <laughs> um, when you were researching, which scientists did you find like most interesting to learn about? So for me personally, I think it was Alice Hamilton, just because I'm a journalist and she did so much investigation. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. 
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.